Lord. Yeah. Ohio State number two in the AP poll. The Oregon Ducks number three in the AP poll. This was a 32 to 31 victory for the Oregon Ducks. Remember a couple weeks ago, Georgia and Bama played. Oh, this was the greatest college football game that we're going to see all year. And then we got a better one. And then we got a better one. Now, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing on television yet, but I was on the sideline for the entire game, watched it up close. There are details and things that you guys did not get a chance to be privy to that I got for you right here. Now, the question I got for you guys, do you believe that this was a better football game, more entertaining for the viewer than the Georgia Bama game? Go ahead and leave it in the comments or anything like that. Of course, we will get to it. And of course, uh, send your stuff in. I'm mad at unafraidshow.com or at George Reister at Unafraid Show, and we will obviously get it in the mailbag this week. So there are some people and some teams in college football that put together a great game day atmosphere. If you have never been to Eugene for an Oregon game or been even any time remotely recently, Oregon puts on a show and then they put on a great football game. It's almost like you go into a Beyonce concert, Bruno Mars, Taylor Swift. You're getting a show in addition to the performance. The performance is important, but the show is great. The environment was insane. And I'm not sure if there's a better game day college experience in the country. So it all started with the Oregon Duck. He came out and did this greatest showman thing. They got circus acts out on the out on the field, flamethrowers juggling. This is the greatest show. And you hear my voices all jacked up because I was yelling on the sideline. The show before it, and then it's amazing. Then the team runs out with the Harley Davidson, everything got video of that, which we got to put in it today. It was amazing. And then came the game. All I had heard all week from people was there's only 60,000 people there. There's only 60,000 people there. Ohio state has played in front of way more people. They played in front of way more people than, than those Oregon ducks are. And I'm sitting there like, yes, Yes, you played in the big house, which has over 100,000 people. Yes, you have played in, you know, Knoxville with 100,000 people. You've played in big stadiums, but there is a difference. The science, the math tells you that 127 decibels, I don't care how many people it is, is loud AF. I want y'all to understand how loud it is in here. Bro, the crowd is crazy. Austin is going wild. It's a 29-28 game right now. 13 minutes to go. What is turned up in this thing? Ohio State Buckeyes experienced it. They experienced it on a level that they did not expect. You had multiple false start penalties, delay of games. They were having trouble communicating, everything else. Their fans are on their message boards and on Twitter and everything. They're letting you know it was loud as hell in there. Loudest game day environment that a lot of them had ever been to. It was a distinct home field advantage. And there were people after the game talking about uh, Ohio State fans. So, oh, I can't believe they called that offensive pass interference. They're even their own coach, Ryan Day, got up in who has done a great job as coach of Ohio State. But after the game, he got up there and made excuses. Oh, Matt, we're, we're not going to blame it on an offensive pass interference call or this call. We're not going to blame it on that. We're, we're just going to get better. And then later on in the press conference, we're not going to blame it on that. So why the hell you keep bringing it up then? You're bringing it up for a reason. You're making excuses. That offensive pass interference call. Zach Smith, former Ohio State coach, he was tweeting me today, and, and he said, Oh, that call is made. Yes, that call is made 90 plus percent of the time in college football. But at, when the when the offensive player pushes off and with, with two hands above the waist, then yes, it's called. But that's a BS call. No, it's not, because it would have been unfair to Oregon had you not made that call. It would have been cheating the other way, especially when it was an obvious call. Then you have people, well, the DB initiated contact first and that's not what would have happened. Yes, there's normal pity pat when they're releasing off the line. But if you two hand shove somebody, it is what it is. I was standing no more than 12 feet from 
literally directly in front of Jeremiah Smith, who, by the way, is an absolute freak show. Freak show. I've never seen a freshman wide receiver look like this. It was the calves for me. He got grown ass man calves. He looks physically developed from the top to the bottom. The kid is as good as advertised, people. If you're wondering about all the Chris Olave, Smith and Jigba talk and all that, listen, I talked to Geno Smith at the game and Smith and Jigba, and they both said, yo, this kid, real deal. Real deal. Like, no games, no playing around. He's that man. He's probably the best Ohio State wide receiver that they've ever had. And they didn't put out a lot of good ones into the league. But we're not hearing the excuses. And at the end of the game, I'm going to ask Dan Dan Lanning, so I will have this answer to you hopefully this this week, about that uh, 12 men on the field, if that was actually on purpose or not. Because if he did that on purpose, boy, that is him and Tasha LaPoy, that would be a genius move. Genius move to put it out there because it was only 10 seconds left. And so what if you get a five-yard penalty? It doesn't matter just as long as you don't allow a catch because the time is the most important thing. But I wanted to talk about Ryan Day and his situation for a second because since he's been the head coach of Ohio State, he's now fallen to one in seven versus top five opponents. One in seven. That's not what you expect out of Ohio State at the top of the recruiting rankings consistently. And Ohio State since 2021 is 0-3 against Michigan and 0-2 against the Oregon Ducks. And I talked about that arrogance earlier. That was a level of arrogance of Ohio State fans, and I get it. If we had won so many national championships, so many Heisman trophies, and yeah, we would, we would probably think that – yeah, new kid on the block, the Big Ten. It was cute. We beat y'all guys in the national championship in 2015. I would just think that, yeah, that, that we're just going to run you over. But that's not what was going to happen. And this Ohio State-Oregon game, it is not going to turn into the or, uh, to the Ohio State-Michigan game. It's not going to turn into the big game. But this is one of them rivalries that's getting ready to develop and heat up because the only way that rivalries happen is the other team wins. Because Ohio State was smoking Oregon every single time they played until 2021. Going back to Terrell Pryor when I was at the Rose Bowl and everything else. But now, hmm, it ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. Because I heard a lot of people say, oh, well, Ohio State's still the better team. It was a one-point loss on the road. That was a great loss. A great loss for Ohio State. But let's look at this from both sides of it. First of all, Ohio State, really good football team. Will Howard is bigger than I thought he was. Seeing him up close and in person, dude, dude's a tank. He's tall, he's thick, like he's a tank. This team looks good getting off the bus. Their offensive line, they, they lost both of their tackles, I believe, at one point in time, and then one of them came back. But this Ohio State team is a formidable team, and they are one of the three best teams, I believe, that I've seen in college football. Oregon, Texas, and Ohio State. Those are the three teams that I've seen this year that are the best at this point in time. This was a physical football game. This was a high-level football game. You had playmakers. You had big plays. You had broken tackles. You had hard hits, smart plays, special teams, everything in between. Ohio State has the opportunity. They still have to play Penn State, which now has elevated for all the people that said the regular season is not going to be as magnified. That Penn State game is going to be as magnified as it gets, particularly if Indiana continues to win because they're tied with Oregon at 3-0 atop the Big Ten standings. That's going to create a must-win situation for a lot of teams, and particularly Ohio State. So this was not a bad loss at all. This was a good loss. But now let's talk about the Oregon Ducks, though. This is a team that went from seven sacks between Idaho and Boise State to none versus Ohio State, UCLA, Oregon State, and Michigan State. So they are peaking at the correct time. And this is a good football team. And now one of the things I want you guys to pay attention to, because Oregon does something that I've seen Georgia do, Alabama do, Ohio State has done it. Earlier in the season, or when they're playing inferior opponents, they're not piling up stats amongst their best players. They're, they're spreading it around because they're playing more players. They are playing the young guys, getting them reps and everything else. But when it came down to a big game, 
Jordan James was pretty much the only back that took carries for the Oregon Ducks. The wide receiver rotation was down. The D-line rotation was down. Linebacker ro- rotation was down, it, aside from their packages and situational stuff. Same thing with the DBs. When it comes down to it, the stars are the guys that are going to play. Uh, but this is a game that led me to believe who the number one team is. Because the AP poll came out and they gave Texas the majority of the number one uh, votes. They gave Tex, they gave Oregon six first place votes and Texas got 56. But let's examine some stats and information because SEC people, they love strength of schedule. They love strength of record. They want to talk about all these other things. Well, let's talk about it right here. So let's go with the Texas and Oklahoma comparison. Because you have Oregon, who has two wins over current top 25 teams. Two. And that is Boise State, which is, yeah, you you can't say nothing about, about them. You got Boise State and you got Ohio State. So that means that they have the best win in college football right now, the Oregon Ducks do. Texas has one win over a top 25 opponent, and that was Oklahoma this last weekend. Oregon has two wins over current top 20 teams. Texas has zero. And Oregon has a win over a current top five team. Texas zero. Strength of schedule. Let's get into that one. Texas is 82nd in the country in strength of schedule right now. Oregon is 35. Oregon's opponents have the best strength of record in the entire country. Numero uno. And Texas is sixth. That means that the teams that you're playing, they're going out and beating other people. That's what that means, that their record is really good. So how did only six of the 62 voters have Oregon ahead of Texas? Make it make sense. And there was even a voter that had Penn State ahead of Oregon. But I digress. So I believe at this point in time, the Oregon Ducks should be the number one team in the nation. But the thing that we have to focus on with the number one team in the nation is, is that it doesn't matter whether you're number one or not. It doesn't. This is the college football playoff. This isn't you trying to be in the top four. This is you winning your conference and getting an automatic berth and a bye, or just getting into the college football playoff and playing your best football at that point in time. Because what does it matter if you get into the playoffs and you're playing like ass when you when you get there? If you blew your wad in the beginning of the season, it don't matter. You have absolutely blown it at that point in time. So that is crucially important. I told you, we know what it is. We know that shit. Yeah. Uh.